I invite you to take out your message notes here, and this is what we do at First Pres, and just a refresher uh, on the front page is our message notes for the sermon today, and then as we're, we're going through the book of John this year, and then on the second page there's some um, questions and study guide for all of John chapter 8, and then there's an article that deals with the subject matter at hand on abandonment. And then on the back page, some questions on the article for your further study. Uh, our scripture lesson this morning comes from John chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 11. So let's listen now to God's word. Uh, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Uh, early in the morning, he came again to the temple all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of this, his holy word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to, right in front of your throne of grace. As the book of Hebrews tells us, we come with confidence in a time of need, a time of help. And so we ask that your amazing grace would fill our hearts this day. That we would allow your grace to explore every nook and cranny, every closet, every room of our heart and to create a new heart within us a clean heart to put a new and right spirit within us and now may we decrease and may you increase and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight O oh Lord you are our rock and our redeemer I think I was in about fifth or sixth grade, Southern California, and my friends and I, probably on a weekly basis, would head down to the liquor store. Now, understand, at that time, at least in my neighborhood, the liquor store was your local curb market, 7-Eleven, uh, you know, Circle K, whatever it was, and they sold liquor there, but that was where you got your candy and your Coke and your Abba Zabba, Hershey's Bar, you know, Butterfinger, Snick, whatever it was, that's where you got your candy. So, weekly basis, we'd ride our bikes down there. And on one particular occasion, we went in there, and at the urging of my friends, because the manager wasn't looking, I snuck a Snickers bar into my pocket. And there's my wife's cell phone again. What in the world? <laughs> Two weeks in a row. This is amazing. I hear it. It's in the bottomless pit of the pocketbook. <laughs> Just stay down there, Julie. Don't sit back up. Don't. So when I was in about fifth or sixth grade, uh, no, I won't start all the way over. But anyway, we go there. So I snuck this Snickers bar in my pocket, started to make my way out of the store, and then, boy, his hand was upon me. And he pulled me over as I looked at my friends as they exited the store. I don't know that guy. I've never seen him before in my life. 
And the manager said, I'll give you two options. I can call your parents. Or you can stand right here next to the counter, next to the cash register for one hour. Oh, I'm, I'm staying right here. <laughs> one hour, piece of cake. So for over the next 60 minutes, every customer that came in, the manager told them what I had done. and berated me, and belittled me, and every customer came in just, hmm, mm, 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 the youth of our day. Ah, da, 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 da. And I felt about so tall by the time that hour was over, I thought to myself, I'll take the phone call next time. <laughs> I don't think there was a next time after that. Um, they never found out. Uh, parents never found out on that one. Unless they're listening to this sermon. Uh, yeah, exactly. Today we're talking about being caught by grace. Getting caught by grace. To begin with, as your message notes there, ungrace catches us by stalking and shaming. It's early in the morning and Jesus came to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? This they said to him that they might have some charge to bring against him. You know, ungrace loves to stalk and to catch and to shame. Now I'm assuming... I believe that John's depiction of the scene here is accurate. That the scribes and the Pharisees have brought a woman to, in the midst of this crowd of people that they have caught in the act of adultery. I always wondered what they kind of looked like. You know, they stalked her, they, they, they caught her, and, but, but when did they catch her? You don't catch someone in the act of adultery when they're by themselves, usually with someone. What happened, what happened to the man? You know, well, double standard back then, probably double standards today, unfortunately. But were they sitting there waiting, let's go in now. No, no, let's wait just a little bit longer. Okay, now let's go in and catch her. You know, and they caught her, they brought her in before, and to shame, and said, you know, the law says we can stone her. What do you say? Have you ever been caught? Have you ever been caught stealing, cheating? taking credit, maybe where credit wasn't due, being self-righteous, accusing someone falsely of something they may, may or may not have done. How easy it is to be ungraceful. How easy it is to, to stalk and to shame, to put the blame uh, and pin that on other people, to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Uh, it was of great distress. It bothers me to this day uh, to learn that uh, the school where my oldest daughter attended school, she was on some kind of council, some kind of moral police, where it was her job, and she said it with great, seemingly great pride, that it's our job to go around and point out the sins of other people. Doesn't that sound depressing? Walk around telling people what, what their sins are? That's easy to do. Anybody can do that. Anybody can go around and point blame and point fingers and, you know, you're not doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. That's easy to do. But ungrace looks to expose, to find faults. How much harder it is to be grace-filled. We're nothing special when we're ungraceful. We have great company in the world in which we live. It's easy to be ungraceful. Jesus knew what it meant to be stalked and to be shamed. Uh, John says that he went to his own hometown and they received him not. Isaiah said he was despised and rejected of men. And of course, the ultimate public humiliation and shame is the cross. Jesus hanging on the cross as people walked by just wagging their fingers in their heads and just pointing fingers. We live in a shame-filled world. How many of us have heard, you ought to be ashamed of yourself? How many have heard that? 
Okay, to those of you who didn't raise your hand, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for not raising your hand. Uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know what? And we were, weren't we? We were. 